Hello everyone. Cold day. Look, we've actually got white stuff out on the floor. Um, but that's okay. It's cold. Uh, cold day. And I'm up here. I've got two things on today. I am doing Neil's uh, Taylor GS Mini and I'm also lining up through here to do a final couple of coats on uh, Steve's ES333. And 57 on the thing there. Look, saying green. That's good. Warming up the lacquer there. That's satin nitro. So, and I've got my alarm set for three, so two o'clock. And when it's two o'clock, I've got to be ah, on the case spraying. But I can do these in and out in between these jobs. Now, this is going to be a fair run through. So, Neil, I hope you don't mind. I'm not going to try not to spend too long talking on this one. I mean, I'm just going to say I've done a lot of background work before I've approached this. So the great thing about Taylor's is if you look at this guitar, apart from a couple of odd little blemishes, uh, flaws in the fingerboard here, which are strange things. Anyway, um, apart from those, it's a beautiful looking guitar. And, um, you know, Taylor, they make these lovely little GS minis. This one is the one without electronics in it. I've had a look all over and it's almost entirely blemish free. There is a little bit of marking a little kind of floor in there, just about in there in the finish, but it's all it's all in all very pretty and good. Strings are a bit dead, um, but so this guitar, according to the serial number, if I'm reading it right, it's either a 20, 19, 19 <laughs> it's, a, it's either a twenty twenty two or a twenty twenty three. I think it's a twenty two. I've forgotten which way round the number reads from. But anyway, the point is, at most it's two years old. And will you look at this? Wow, that is six millimeters. Right, that is an enormous amount of height, and well, we've got some reduction. Looks like it's happened already on the saddle down here. That's not really high, um, but it's quite t high at this end. But the whole action here is really, really high. So, what I do with these is I, um, well, I don't panic with tailors because the great thing about tailors, and this is why I recommend them a lot, is because they have a paired shim system. Okay, and these paired shims, one on the heel and one on the fingerboard extension, worked uh, sympathetically, oh, reciprocal. Um, you change them as a pair, and in doing so, you change the angle of the joint, but it's a beautiful little system, very clever. And um, in, so basically, it means that the, a tailor, when it starts to deform, which I have to say is what happens to acoustic guitars, is they change shape. This one's got quite a pronounced bulge uh, hump behind the bridge. Not so much. There's no lifting of the bridge yet, but it's quite it's quite a, a lift. So all acoustic guitars, pretty much all, unless you get lucky, but almost all acoustic guitars deform in that sort of way. This lifts up. The bridge lifts up, raises the action. The neck can't pull in this way, so it tends to press the extension in a bit and it deforms the, s the surface here in the sound hole. There's a little f finished blemish there. Um, anyway, so it's, it's inevitable that happens to all acoustic guitars. Now most mid-range acoustics, I've forgotten what these are new, but you know most budget sort of th 200 to 600 pound guitars that have conventional glued neck joints, um, when they reach this stage, all you can do well, before they reach the stage, if you want to make an action adjustment, all you can do is lower the saddle, which reduces the brake angle of the strings over the saddle, which has an impact on how it presses down on any piezo-style pickup here, and also has a, a reduction in the amount of force it transmits through the top of the guitar. So, really, if your action's changing, as it will, unfortunately, acoustic guitars, why do they change? Quick detour. Um, it's a playoff between... Um, if you like, dynamics of the tone versus strength of the structure. The less strong the structure, the more twinkly and pretty the dynamics are. And I'm afraid pretty tonal dynamics seems to have won out over structural strength. The result is that pretty much all acoustic guitars are going this way. And as you can see, this is an incredible, really, I'm sorry to say, Taylor, but that to be at that point in two years is just very depressing. Now, like I say, if you don't have a guitar like a Taylor, you can only reduce the action by taking down the saddle or 
the expensive four to six hundred pound um, steaming off, pulling out frets, steaming off of the whole glue section here, and then carving, recarving of the two faces of the joint, and so on and so forth. It's an expensive and time-consuming thing, and it's out of the reach of any of these, most of these budget guitars. But with a tailor and some other manufacturers, one of them now has started to be the Martin, but more about that perhaps later as I'm going through. But the tailor got in first, I think, of the big brands, and it very smartly introduced this shim system. One, one here and one here. And it allows you to make, uh, I would say the advantage is it allows you, once you've bought the guitar, to take it to a tech like myself who can set it the way you want first of all so i can then kind of redo the action so if it's from the outset it's the way you like it even from new and that will be done with the shims um, and i can also do it by retaining as much brake angle as possible over the saddle which is the ideal situation um, down the line like this let's forget for a minute it's only two years old but let's say it was 10 years old and it had become unplayable then oops then what i can still do is take uh, the shims change them out make a big reduction here in the action um, and hopefully in an ideal world we can make such a reduction here that we can um, reinstall a new saddle to re kind of re um, increase the brake angles because often a guitar may come having had this lowered if people don't know about the shims or they aren't, haven't been able to get the shims a tech and, and, and I did this myself in the past when I couldn't get Taylor shims. The only thing I could do for somebody was to lower it as much as possible within reason by the saddle. So great thing is um, Taylor for a long time seemed to only allow uh, authorized retailers and dealers and fixers to have these shims. But now I've seemed to more and more people are getting through to them and they are providing them and they're being very very good about it and I think it's a brilliant move to do it because actually this is not rocket science you have to be careful and not supplying these to fairly decent quality techs which I would call myself I'm not a trained tailor tech but I would say I'm a cautious careful logical guitar tech and supplying it to me allows me to make their customers happy without having to send them all around the world to different service centers and weeks of waiting and stuff. So good move, Taylor. That's my verdict on this. Um, bad move, Martin, who've brought out a shim-based system, even more high-tech. Apparently, not only haven't they released any shims or won't release or supply any shims to approved, approved techs. Sorry, they haven't supplied them to careful decent techs like me they haven't even applied supplied them to their authorized repair techs or dealers um, and so they can't even do it so when you get as a customer of mine did the other day when you get a new martin i've forgotten the the one the, the one with the shims um, and he wanted the action lowering and i did some research and but together actually we found that there's no way we were ever going to be able to get these shims so not even the factory would do it. it. It looked like he was stuck with this action. So what was the point? That was a terrible mistake, Martin. Unless you change that, you're going to lose out in sales, period. Anyway, Taylor's done it the right way, making it accessible. Um, so off camera, I've done a number of things. I've, I've taken the neck off. I've checked the original shim numbers that were there. I've supplied them to Martin with the serial number and the customer's name and various other measurements and so on and so forth. And they're kindly sending me some shims on the way. Now, luckily, having done this a few times now, I'm building up each time they, sorry, I'll, I'll slow down. Each time they do this, they very kindly send three or four different pairs of shims, which means I'm building up a collection, which means I can find what I need without forcing Neil to wait any longer, 10 days for a courier to come in from Taylor, which is a brilliant service from Taylor, but I'm in the lucky position of being able to do this from my increasing spares, which is great. Now, the downside of this, as I know from previous experience, I'm pretty certain, and I've asked them, they don't do a bigger jump than the one this needs, or they don't do as big a jump in shims. So Taylor kind of haven't even got it quite covered for the actual change in action this guitar has over the over the short two years so what I've done off camera is I've gone through a few stages of these shims because we're starting out with the six and to bring the neck back up we're just thinking about the heel shim at the moment that the, this one just follows suit with a certain relationship um, but that started out with a heel shim numbered six 
and to bring the neck up towards the strings, which is what we want to do, we need to increase that number. So I sort of went, okay, 6 to 10, 12, 14, something like that, tried one, no chance. So after a couple of tests, it doesn't even work with my 28s. So I know that 30 is the top of the range. So I'm kind of, a, I've hit the buffers here. I'm going to fit the 30s because that's all I can do. And then if, if, well not if, I'm going to then, sadly, not ideally, I'm going to take a bit of height off this saddle. Because at a push it is acceptable, it's, it's high enough to lose some height on there without spoiling the enjoyment. And I know that my customer wants uh, low playability. Um, he's not necessarily concerned in losing a <coughs> I don't know, a quarter of a percent of sound projection by losing a, a degree of angle here. Um, we're going to aim for playability and unfortunately we don't go any stronger than this and it needs more than this. It probably needs about a 36 or something. <coughs> anyway, so I've had the neck off and on a couple of times to do this check, save it boring y'all. So having come to having done my assessments and, and pretty much figured out what I can and can't do, I'm now going to set about changing the shim set <coughs> in the same at the same sort of time I'm going to change the nut for a new tusk one. Um, I had a spare uh, tusk saddle ready. The problem is that the tusk saddles, or the saddles that tusk make supposedly for the GS Mini or suitable for the... Ah, uh, wait a minute, this does have a curvy line. Oh, that's brilliant. I didn't think it had a curvy line, but it does. Oh, okay, so I could have used that. Problem is, we don't actually need to put it back to full height. Had we had the correct shims, like a 38, as I said, 36 or 38, then we would have perhaps put a slightly taller one in there just to go back up to its full proud height, but we don't. So I'm going to not use that in this case, but I'm going to use the new tusk nut, which will need some work to thin it down to fit in here. But we'll we're going we're gonna to reduce this a little bit. But I'm first of all, first operation is I'm going to undo all of this and show you how I change the shims. So straight on into it, I'm going to slack off the strings glad I've got this battery thing because I've done quite a bit of that slacking. Now the problem I've got, if I need to go and sand in a minute, I'm going to, I may have to come back onto camera wearing a mask, in which case it's not going to make commentary very easy, but I have to do, the priority I've got is to, is more to finish the uh, spraying of the ES333 than it is to film this one. I've got loads of um, films of GS Mini shim changes to buy now. Uh, loads of videos showing that. So much as I'd like to do the whole of this, if I run out of time, I'll carry on with a mask on. And you may just have to put up with me mumbling, which is for some people actually better than um, being able to hear me clearly. So I'm leaving the strings on because whoops, I'm going to need to, um, well, they'll be handy. And what I will do while well, I'm just, just getting this sort of bit done is I'm just going to lightly tack the strings out the way so I can not have to worry about them. So I've got a couple of tools that I have, or I have some tailor tools. They're not really tailor tools, but they're tools that do the tailor jobs. And I keep them always to hand and separate. Um, and they look like, actually, that, that's another one. So I have one for the Taylor GS Bolt. I have one for the Taylor GS Mini uh, Hex Nut. And I have one for the Taylor GS Mini uh, doo -doo, Trust Rod, which is a lot smaller than a Gibson one. It's the same style, but a lot smaller. But I don't need that one just yet. I need these two for this. So in this guitar, there are two screw, uh, two bolts. One is a hex bolt which is pointing upwards and its purpose is to secure and hold the uh, fingerboard extension in place. So what I'm just going to do with that one to begin with, I'm just going to slack it off with the hex key and I'm going to, um, with my fingers, undo it. It has, this one has, I believe two, in this case, two washers on it, two metal washers. So I'm going to make sure they all come out, those two come out together. One silver one, one little black one, and you can see it's a, a hex bolt. Now that's this part of the, f the uh, neck joint undone. 
Now I'm going to go in with my other one. It's quite hard to locate it, but when you do, you can just turn it. And I'm going to... Now, at this point, I'm holding this neck joint here so it doesn't move around. I don't want it to move around. The reason I don't want it to move around is because when they first make these in the factory, once they put the shims in and everything, they fill any gaps with... Um, uh, what's that stuff? Like wood, f wood filler. Um, and so when you first come to remove the neck, you have to, you don't have to do it now because I've done it a few times, but you, you would need to place it down on here, ignore that it's doing that, and then you push down with, on this heel here for it to come apart. So I'm just going to float this round as if I didn't do that. And then what we have, go in there, we have the current shim pair. Okay, and you see the joint, you can see the shim pair, there's a six and a zero. They're always six apart. The, the uh, extension shim is always six less than the heel shim. But what's great about these things is they, together, they make a perfect little um, angle to float the neck over. Right angle type thing, pivot for the neck. Now, I'm going to remove these. Some of the re replacement shims, by the way, in case you get some, uh, some of the replacements, these often don't quite fit in there. So what you have to do is just run them on a flat sanding block until they do. But do a stroke on each end so that they're moving in the same amount. It's not. It never requires a huge amount, but you don't want to. You don't if it's way. Well, it's never is way over, but you definitely want to be being very careful. So the minimal amount of sanding because you're changing the length of the shim. Uh, but it's, it's, you, you don't want to be cutting into that. But that's the only... I've had it happen a couple of times, but a, like I say, a couple of runs on a flat block, um, it's done. So there's this set, no good anymore. Miles no good. We're going to take out the high set that I've got, and the only one, and it's a bit... Um, if I get another guitar in this condition, um, I'm going to be short. Unless, of course, I'm hoping that from the measurements I gave, Taylor will work out that this needs the maximum shimmage possible and I hope that they will therefore uh, send that. This is, this is interesting. I was on the understanding that this fitted in such a way that that came up flush with this. On this one, funnily enough, it doesn't quite. Um, uh, 30 and 24 is correct. But you see this one isn't fitting. So I haven't tried this one yet. So I'll show you exactly now what I do. As I'm going to... Yeah, you can see it. Yep. I'm going to put it on here and I'm going to go uh, a, a light push down there and a light push on this side here. So the hole lines up in here and that's about perfect. So we've got the flush here. I, I'm a bit surprised. I thought that fitted there. So that may be a slight miss cutting of this or it may be a slight miss cutting of this section here. Um, that's interesting. It could explain why there are some tiny nicks on the edge of here, Stevie Nicks. You see this? I haven't seen this before. See those little tiny nicks? I think that's because this, unless I'm mistaken from the kind of maths and science of it, I think this should be absolutely flush with... Now watch what I do when I pull it up. That sh I think that should be sitting as flush there as possible, which corresponds with that sitting flush. I think this one on this guitar is, is sitting slightly under, as you can see. I think what that means is that the wood is pressing too much against there and biting. But there you go, Taylor. Just a little observation. Another one. Right, so I've got them to fit in now. So the next thing I want to do, um, and you can probably see there's some, there's little bits of wood chipped off here where they've, I don't know what they've done. It's, it's been kind of worked to get it to fit, or it's, some of it's come off here because it's, actually it's come off on here because it's stuck to the wood filler. So the wood filler has acted like a glue and torn off some of the, some of the uh, edge of this, but it's, it's in there and it's going to sit back in with no problem at all. <laughs> if there's any flaky bits like this, um, either put them back where they were, or if they're not looking like they're going to go back, lose them rather than get them trapped in there in some ill-fitting way. So importantly, I'm now grabbing this with both hands and I'm pushing it together so it's as snug as it can be. And by finger, I'm 
hands and doing in the first the heel bolt. And the heel bolt really is the important locator one. The extension bolt just holds down the extension snugly. So um, I don't have a torque wrench and I know that Taylor does use a torque wrench in its videos. But what I tend to do is I tend to n n mentally note the pressure that these are under as they came, come off. It's not ideal, but I wouldn't have a, I don't think I could get a, a torque wrench to fit in there that would do that job. Now I've got to find the, locate this bolt, which is never easy when you can't see it. When you find it, it drops straight in like that. You always think it's the thing before that. Okay, so I can see already that it's it's pushed the end of this up quite a lot. But it has to because the action is so bad. Now we're going to I'm going to do this up. We're going to restring it. Oh I'm going to drop the hex key in there. Gonna, once I've done this, we're going to restring it. I'm going to assess it and see how far off the optimal action and I still think it's going to be well I saw it when I did it before so it is going to be a bit off um, I'm going to tighten this up by feel uh, it doesn't take too much to tighten it up there we go all right so that's the new shim done and the new position um, and because I've done it as a pair and the correct reciprocal reciprocating reciprocal pair it means that uh, there's not going to be any distortion or anything. Now the, the problem with taking off strings like this and putting them back on is you end up spending precious setup time and I'm just going to have to check my clock here. I am 15 minutes away from uh, that's not going to work is it? 15 minutes away from needing to get into spray mode but let's put these strings back on and do the assessment anyway so this is the this is the pain in the back backside bit once you've taken strings off you either flatten them all out again in which case you weaken them extremely and they run a very strong risk of breaking or you sort of fiddle your way to undoing them this this has already kind of started to s snake away so I'm going to spin the last bit of free coiling wire to get it on I didn't bring my book with me but I did uh, I do remember the measurements the measurements when I contact Taylor they like to work in the uh, in the um, 12th fret measurements they work in millimeters or they ask for it in millimeters which is good but I always work for my reference point is always at the last fret um, and that's just because it suits me not because it, I'm cleverer than anyone else or there's any massive reason but it suits me for personal reasons to do it that way so actually what the number I gave to Taylor wasn't that dramatic I think it was like four and a half mils at the 12th fret uh, on the low E but actually when I take it back to my my mental reference point or my normal reference point of the last fret action it actually came as six millimeters at the last fret which considering that my my personal preference for a tailor is two millimeters at the last fret um, or two between two and 2.5 no lower than two um, then you can tell that six is a is three times higher which is a, a, a unplayable as far as I'm concerned So, you have to just bear with me, I'm sorry about this boring bit. This is the bit that takes all of the time. Um, I'm actually trying to get the, get the damn thing to stay in while you do it up. It's, it's nuts. Come on, which way around is it going to go? Hold it. Stay in place. Do it up. So I'm going to do put this. Oh, I put the wrong blasted one on, haven't I? You didn't notice. There's me 
thinking it's an electric guitar, so I've got to undo this one, take it off. Uh, uh, and then I always <laughs> normally get stung as I try and do that. The last little bit comes off and bites you as it flips off. So, uh, get on. Sorry about this. So I have to say, while I'm doing this bit, I, I'm I, I'm s astonished that a guitar can be in this condition. You know, a quality-made guitar can be in that action condition. And the the number of times over the years when I've seen this situation. And I've heard people sort of minimise it, you know, and say, oh, that's not, you know, blah, 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 it's not that bad, and, you know, not everyone wants a really low action. Um, well, I have to say, everyone I know does, and nobody I know wants a six millimetre last fret action and a four and a half millimetre uh, high E action last fret. It's just horrible. Um, so, somehow, these end up in that condition that, and I know that some people at companies like Taylor, I know Robert Taylor is quite, he's a, he's a sti um, what's the word, a, an exponent of the dangers of uh, issues with, um, what's the word that, humidity. He's a very big on humidity guy. Um, the problem with that is that most people in the UK, it's not a very dry country, but most people in the UK live in houses with about 50 to 60 percent humidity range. Sometimes it's quite a bit less, but but they don't live in the jungle. And um, when you look at the claimed norms for uh, relative humidity, it tends to say something like 45 to 55 percent is good. Um, and this isn't so far off that. Okay, so now here we have our maximum shim on there. Shimon. Uh, it's a lot lower, but it is by far or is far from perfect. So we have to do a sort of look at what we've got going on here. Um, we've got, what's better? We have 2.5, 3, 3, 5, I would say 3, 7, 5 from 6, which is, yeah, a hell of a lot better, but not brilliant. So uh, we've got low E, last fret, what did I say, 3.75 from 6. And high E, E, last fret, we've got, we're on two point, just smidgen under 2.5. Um, now, let's see if we could get to my target, ideal target. I'm not sure we even could with this. Um, the important thing is we have to work out what we've got available to us at max. So sitting it next to the high E, uh, as it stands, we've got two mils maximum. That would be there. That, that would be level with the ground. So we can't go two mils down on that one. Next to the low E, we've got three point. So call it three point eight mils. So there's quite a lot more available on there. Right, so let's imagine we can take a millimetre off the um, off the high E end, and let's imagine we could take 2.5 off the base end. What would we get to? Well, 
we, we have to divide it by 1.4 to tell us what we'd end up with. So let me get my calculator, um, what the actual reduction would be. So uh, it's about 1.4, it's, it's an approximation. But so we're going to, what we're going to say, oh yeah, um, one millimeter reduction down here times, uh, sorry, divided by 1.4 gives me a 0.75 reduction at this end here. So we could get 0.75 off there, which wouldn't be too bad. And then on the base side, if we took down 2.5, I said, uh, if I said minus 2.5, so 2.5 divided by 1.4 equals 1.7. Okay. Is that the right color? I'm going to the right color. 1.7. We could take off 1.7. So that tells me we could get the we could get the low E potentially without too much well, the end of the world trouble. We could potentially go to two, which might just be a bit low. This one we can go to 1.75 which is a little bit high for my liking. So uh, I would go, I would go, I would aim to go 2.25 uh, on the base end. We can, we can afford that. On the base end, 2.25, 2.25, uh, so let's call it 1.5 divided by 1.4 equals 1.07. That would take us down. Uh, was that 1.5? If I took it down 1.5, I'm, I'm driving myself mad here. So 3.75, if I took off 1.75, I could end up with a last fret action of 2. 1.75. Right, that, so yeah, that turned in 2 millimeters, turned into 1.75. If I, 1.5 millimeters, I did that. 1.5 millimeters divided by 1.4 turned into a drop of a, a millimeter, 1.1. Uh, so that would go down to 2.6, 2.6, 1.5, 1.75. So if we did, what would happen if we did 1.75 here? Uh, sorry, not that one. If we did 1.75 here. 1.75, clear, 1.75 on that side, divided by 1.4, would equal 1.25, and that would take us down to 2.5. I think that would be the way to go. So there's my target. Uh, that means I'm going to take a millimeter and 1.25. Did I say a millimeter? Uh, one point. Sorry, one point five. Let me just double check that again. One point five. So I've written it down here wrong. I want a millimeter instead of two. I'm going one five. Clear it again. Just to double check. One point five divided by one point four equals my one point seven. Call it one point one. One point one from there. One point one. Take two off there. It's one point one. one point equals two point five. Let's try it again. I'm confusing myself. If I took two off the base side times one point four, that means I'm taking one and a half off the whole action. That is two point seven five, two point two five. I just think I'll stick at it at the two. That's the simplest way of doing it the two on that side and the two on that side and we said this one was we said this one was what at this side not 1.9 so we've taken one off there it was 1.9 it was 3.8 there and we're taking two so that's what we're aiming for or we'll do it in two halves of that okay let's check my time it's time for me to spray so I'm going to pause on this or I could take you with me spraying, but I think I need to concentrate a bit on that for a minute. So what I'm going to do is, off camera, 
uh, while I'm wearing a mask. I'm going to reduce this down to get a bit more, a better angle, out, a better action out of this. And I'm going to do it in two stages. So if my reduction is um, planned at uh, one and two, I'm going to go treble in two stages, treble and bass. I'm going to go 0 0.5 is my first stage and one, and then I'm going to go another 0 0.5 and that's going to come down to two. So one, yeah, two halfway bits and I'm going to test each time. And then once I'm happy with that, I'm going to move on and do the nut, which maybe I'll come back on for video, but maybe not sound. All right, <sighs> pause this for now. Thank you for watching. See you in a bit. Sorry about the sound here, folks. Um, obviously muffled. Just want to let you know, done the saddle, fitted the nut, haven't glued it yet. And beautiful action. Everything's fine, as good as it's going to be. <sighs> and we'll just do a quick measurement to see the last fret action in this case. And we'll get on to cleaning it up, gluing the nut and stringing it. So the last fret action here is, yes, 2.25, 1.5, .5. yes, oh, the strings aren't stretched, I mean tightened. So I'm going to move things out the way, tidy up, put this out of the way while I do, and Stick with me, we'll just get round to finishing it off. So that's kept, we'll use that again. Put our spares away, all paired up nicely. <laughs> I'm trying to get the last tiny dusting coat of finish onto the ES333, and I'm so close to there. And this time there's a miniature hair on it. I'm gonna see after I've, after I've, um, after I've um, 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 after it's dried, I'm going to see if it will come off without me having to sand it. That would be good. <coughs> oh, I need the cutters. <coughs> cutters I need. Uh, the tools for this beastie I don't need right now, but I need them safely over there. So, tape out the way. Thanks. Tape out the way, I said. Tools, tuning, I need the tuning fork. Old nut can go away. That can go there. That can go in there. That can go out the way. That can go in the bin. Keep those out of the way. So basically I've got the whole act of the whole um I've got the whole nut done perfectly. And I'll have to say, also the uh, got the saddle perfect too, which is great. All right, we are almost ready. Move that out of the way. So I'm going to take these strings off. We're gonna, oh, we're going to glue the nut down first. That's what we're going to do. the way it should be. Put the strings loosely on there. Make sure the ends are 
easily matched up. Good. Get the little ones done. Right. Just basically using that to hold the nut in place, and we can get rid of the other strings now. Or if we really want to, we can tighten them up for a minute or two as well. Make sure everything's glued down. Lovely. Gluing, 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 gluing. I've got water building up in here, so it sounds probably sounds terrible. Okay, that's just about right. It's a tiny bit. It's, a, it's about quarter of a millimetre short, this nut. So, in an ideal world, it would be just a little bit fatter. Matching them up is really hard to do. So. Okay, I'm happy. We are glued. And time to take everything off. So the idea of um, here of just oops, just taking putting the glue lightly on the front edge of the nut is so that it doesn't rip up the the nut shelf next time or if it should have to be changed. So we're trying to prevent that. So off comes the old strings. We're going to give this a clean down with naphtha. <coughs> Hearing dust in here. <coughs> ah, um. Excuse me. Me. Slightly lift those out for a minute. bone dust or the nut residue. Right, also any grime that's built up on here from the past like so. Get that nice clean fingerboard clean, clean around the bridge. There we go. Now I did originally set the um, neck relief but it may require fitting again, so we'll keep an eye out for that at the end, because uh, there's a bit of grime on there, sticky stuff, it looks like, coming off like it looks like nicotine, I have to say. I'm sure it's not tailor finish, by the way, it doesn't, tailor finish does get soft after a while, um, but it's usually in combination with sweat and finger glue, grease and glue and stuff. Okay, so that's feeling good, looking good. A bit nervous about this, whatever this is over here. I don't want to rub it too hard. Whatever it is, it's to come off. Yeah, it's coming off bit by bit. Some sort of stain from the past. Um, so what we're going to do is, Get this last bit of glue off. And then we'll put some oil on the fingerboard and on the bridge. And then we'll fit our new strings and we'll bag it and I'll do the stretching of the strings at home. 
mainly because um, I'm going to run out of time. I've just got to get the just get the uh, thing finished. Just give me a blade, would you? I've got to get the spray finished. So I'm just pulling up any loose or less excess glue from that front edge fixing. And I'm going to get me a bit of oil. I'm going to rub this in. Well, that's the transformation um, with a combination of approaches, unfortunately, only limited really by uh, Taylor's shims. And that's actually an interesting one because uh, people have asked in the past, can you double up the shims? You know, can you overlay them? You can't really. And al also, what you can't really do is make your own because, uh, well, you if you put an exact same amount on each end or uh, on each place uh, but you're going to get an air gap which is okay you can kind of live with that i suppose but it's not ideal so you really you really wouldn't want that to be happening uh, but you know in the future, that may be the only options you've got left. Right, so, springs, ahoy, so we can get there and say we're done. I find, I never can tell, I order these strings, and when I get them, I think they look very yellow for Oh, these are 8020 bronze. Okay, so they're not phosphor bronze. They're, they're 8020 bronze. It's okay. These are 1047, so they're quite light. Relatively light. Um, yeah, the colours, the strings, confuses me all the time. Phosphor bronze is a reddier colour. Bronze is a yellowy colour. But the problem with the bronze ones is that they do look worryingly like the colour that you get with the cheap Chinese knockoffs. But these are a genuine packet, as you can tell by the ceiling and everything. But it is, it's a funny old world to worry about it and try and get it right. Now, I'm, as I'm doing this, I'm thinking about my spray. I've got such a nice, I think I've got such a nice finish there now already. But what I don't really want to be doing is sanding it again, doing another spray. I mean, sanding it just to remove that uh, piece of, tiny piece of fluff, a little hair, coily bit of spider's web or something. And uh, that won't come out. I don't really want to be doing that. Um, so I'm wondering whether it's actually better to leave it and brush it off, because it probably will come out anyway with the slightest of touches. Um, it's a... It's a... Uh, it's such a micro finish, so it should be fine, really. There we go, first one on. We're doing opposite sides. Which we could do with the things pointing in the right direction. So this will be a, a huge change in the way it plays, there's no doubt about it. Um, so like I say, it's so far out, it's required a fair bit more work, um, or it, it's required, we haven't been able to do it all with shimming, which I'd have preferred to have done. Thanks to the fact that uh, Taylor runs out at 30. I 
think we're pretty much there. The only one thing this thing might benefit from would, as a final thing, if we can't get a shim above 30, would be maybe fitting a, a bridge, JLD bridge doctor or bridge system. Which may go some way to bringing the top down. But, having said that, I think this should play beautifully for a few years. done, I'll check the finish, and I'll make a decision whether I do a tiny bit more or I am done. and a half degrees boiling in here. light as a feather man. That's it. I'm cutting off. I'm done. Sorry about the sound and the muffled, but check the action now. Oh wow. Lovely. And there's still enough brake angle to do the job, even on the high E. So that's pretty good. There we have it. Thank you very much. Oh, and here's the low of the action over the first set. Isn't that be beautiful? There we are. All done. Thank you very much. See you soon.